Yes, good morning. Welcome to everyone who did not go to Stratford, who did not uh, have some other reason. Today's lunch for Omer, right? Sorry? Today's lunch for Omer. No, tomorrow. Today is Lave Ba Omer, which is also good. The uh, Lave Hearts and so on. Tomorrow is Lag Ba Omer. Yes. Um, I will note that um, I think I mentioned it in the email that I sent out for this class that uh, the week after this series ends, I'll be starting a three-part series at Beth Tikva, God willing. Um, I have to make a flyer at some point for it, but inspired by the topic for this week, for this series, um, it will be philo-Semites of Jewish history, people who liked us or acted as though they did. Um, and we'll see their motivations, their impacts. Um, it's a three-week mini-series. Philo-Semites. Yeah, not like the dough. The, um, <laughs> no, it, it's the opposite of anti-Semites, right? People who liked us. So um, I, don't, I don't think I made that word up. I think that word exists. Um, the, uh, we'll be talking about uh, Cyrus the Great. Uh, we'll be talking about King Casimir III of Poland. And we'll be talking about Napoleon. The, uh, so uh, a little bit of a, uh, of a, sele- a little bit of a selection. I think it's Monday, so uh, No, that's going to be Wednesdays. The thing is going to be Wednesday. Yeah, th- I can't do Mondays because there are other things going on on Mondays in June. Um, that was one, and then uh, also after that series, we'll have the annual June July series at Orchayim in uh, my baby Drash. Um, yes, it's free that series, um, and the topic is the Jew of the future. And I'll be sending out a flyer for that one uh, as well. We'll be looking at some interesting, uh, interesting ideas. I hope. Can we bring our grandchildren? You can bring your grandchildren. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, they'll be out of school. That's the Jew of the future. Shh, what? One of? Beth Tikva. Oh, Beth Tikva? I think they do it for free. I think Beth Tikva is just free. Yeah, no, I think Beth Tikva makes a donation to the Baby Drash and, uh, and, it's, and it's free. I'm sorry, the Beth Tikva is on Wednesdays. This time it's going to be Wednesdays. Yeah. Oh, because last week... Okay. Yeah, I had to do it on Wednesdays in uh, in June because Shavuot is Sunday, Monday. Oh, okay. So I couldn't figure out a way to get a Monday series in. Okay. So hopefully that will still work. Rabbi? Yes? Before you start, um, could you possibly um, consider or would you approve of the statement that Luther was a philosopher? Nope. <laughs> no, we're going to get to that. His question was, Bernie's question was, would you consider that Luther was a philo-Semite or philo-Semite, however you want to pronounce it? At the beginning. And we'll talk about his beginning. Right. Don't worry, we're going there. Right. We're going there. But no, I have, I have absolutely, you know what, it's funny. I thought that it would be good for me to put a picture of the person I'm describing on the source sheet. I couldn't do it with Abed al Mumin. We don't, we don't have any. But with Luther, there, there are loads of portraits of Luther. But I just can't stomach looking at him. The, uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't. You can find him online. You can look at him on the cover of any number of books. I can give you all sorts of recommendations. Um, but but um, that's also true, but... but yeah. So again, last time we gave some background on the big picture of 16th century Germany and Jewish life then. We talked about um, how change is already coming for the Catholic Church at that point. There's a lot of turbulence, a lot of ferment, the discovery of the Western Hemisphere um, by those who had not already been living there, um, the, uh, the growth of the Ottoman Empire, this Muslim Empire in what ha- they thought of as what should be Christian Europe, um, the, the Renaissance and its humanism, the printing press. So change is coming for the Catholic Church. They just don't know it yet. Um, the ideas of the Reformation which we, which we presented, and I gave you bullet points at the top of the sheets, you can see them there. Um, an emphasis on scripture as opposed to what, uh, what priests were, were saying. Doctrine really comes from scripture. Faith is the way to redemption and not good works. You can't force God to uh, reward you or forgive you. Um, and uh, there's no need for priests as intermediaries to God. It is the priesthood of all believers. And a criticism of the church for materialism, and in particular the idea that somebody who has sinned is able to pay a, to pay a sum and 
and uh, repent or atone really by, uh, by paying that sum. And all four of those are also brought to bear against the, against the Jews, not only against the Catholic Church. Finally, we talked about Jewish life in Europe being very troubled under the Catholics. There's a range in different countries, but I gave you sources last time about the, uh, the allegations that we were poisoning wells, um, desecrating the, uh, the wafer that represented their savior, ritual murder, Jews are being expelled frequently from communities. Um, the Jews are certainly not integrated. They're marked by the Jewish clothing that they have to wear. Uh, their homes are marked. Um, that, that kind of life. And, and Eastern Europe is much better, and we'll get to that, I hope, today. Because as I said in my email, today is going to be all Luther. Um, I, I have jettisoned Maria Teresa. Maybe she'll come back in another series. I did a lot of reading, so I'm hoping so. In particular, the dynamic between her and Rabbi Yechezka Landau, the Noda Yehuda, who was the leading rabbi of Prague uh, during her reign, um, is very interesting, but, uh, but it's just not going to make it into this series. No, that's Maral of Prague. He's before her. He actually comes up today, interestingly. So, Martin Luther and the Jews... So we're not going to do his general biography, as interesting as that would be. Um, we're going to talk Jewish specific. Because of expulsions of Jews, Luther doesn't see them on a day-to-day basis. He doesn't have real contact with Jews. However, he has particular incidents. And they were apparently very memorable because he wrote about them, he talked about them, he talked about them multiple times, he changed his story the different times that he brought up what happened. Um, But we have records of his interactions with Jews. And I brought you a digest of a few of them in source number one from Thomas Calvin's excellent book, uh, Luther's Jews. And keep in mind, this is originally written in German and then translated. So here we, you get a summary of some of his stories about Jews. Um, right off the bat, I have to explain something. It begins with a table talk entry. Table talk was exactly what it sounds like. Records written by Luther's students of conversations at Luther's dinner table. The, uh, when he had guests over, he had people over. So this was a record of stories, things that happened, things that he said. Um, not too many jokes, as I understand it. Um, so a table... Sorry? He had a dish. He had a dish, exactly. A table talk entry that in the early days... And the phrase early days indicates you're probably talking 15 teens, maybe early 1520s. There was a record of Regensburg Jews having sent Luther in Wittenberg a German translation in Hebrew characters of Psalm 130, which is significant. Psalm 130 is... Shiram Alav Imam, Akim, the prayer, out of the depths, I cry out for help. So the Jews of this community send him a German translation using Hebrew letters. Luther is able to read Hebrew. He's proficient in Hebrew. So why do they send him that? They were so pleased with Luther, this uh, student records. It seems to have been a petition for help against persecution and expulsion because at this point... Luther has already published, so it must be early 1520s, Luther has already published something called That Jesus Was Born a Jew. And I will give you an excerpt of that in source number two. It is what feeds the idea that Bernie proposed, that maybe Luther originally was not so against Jews. We'll talk about what he said, but it certainly might have given people the impression that he would be sympathetic. They are facing persecution, and so they send him this out-of-the-depths appeal. Will you help us? Will you intercede on, on our behalf? We do not have a record of his response. However, continuing in this passage number one, after Luther's historic appearance before the emperor and the imperial diet, and the imperial diet is their assembly, right? It's a legislative, well, it's not truly legislative because you have an emperor for that, but um, it is more or less the, the, uh, the assembly um, for, for government. Um, and this was, as I added in brackets, when Luther was banned for heresy. Right, the Holy Roman Empire was not such a fan of the whole Reformation idea at this point. So, um, so Luther was, uh, was, uh, was summoned, tried, and banned for heresy. Well, many people flocked to his lodgings. 
because you know you know what banning does. Right? As a general rule, it makes people popular. So. Noblemen and scholars of every kind wanted to see the man whom the whole world was talking about. Two Jews also wanted to see him, perhaps members of the flourishing Jewish community in Worms, or connected to the Jewish delegation that was attempting to negotiate at the imperial diet about the events in Regensburg. So these Jews wished to come to him, to, and here, it, uh, as the record goes on, they want to discuss religion. And they want to talk to him about scripture, and about Christian perspectives on how to read the Bible. And as the story goes, he trots out Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 is a favorite chapter for Christian missionaries. It is the one that speaks about a messianic time and how a new king will arise who will be uh, loyal to God and that will usher in the period when the lion lies down with the lamb and so forth. They, um, so it's a very Messiah-oriented period. And as they tell the story here, as Luther tells the story, because it's Luther's own account, um, one of the two is convinced by him him, that this is actually referring to the Christian Savior, and the other one is not convinced at all. The, um, but one of them is won over by, by Luther. The, the third account that we get, the next evidence of personal contact between Luther and Jews, we're still in source number one, in the middle of the source, for those who just came in, comes from the mid-1520s. Two or three rabbis, and he gives record in different places of who these rabbis were, and whether there were two or there were three, came to see Luther in Wittenberg and engaged in learned discussion with him. At the end of the document, he used, uh, so he, um, sorry, he presents them with a document to give them safe passage. But that was a thing. Jews, in order to be able to go through Christian lands, needed a document from someone in power offering them safe, or not offering, guaranteeing them safe passage. So he gives them a document like that, but with a Christological formulation along the lines of, for J.C.'s sake, they should be allowed to pass. I should explain why I keep writing J.C. The, um, the name Jesus in and of itself is not a name of any particular standing. Um, however, his last name, so to speak, means king. It's a reference to him as a god or whatever you know, version of the Trinity one accepts, you know, some version of God. And we have a biblical verse that says, V'shem Elohim acherim lo tazkiru. You shall not name the gods of others. You shall not mention the gods of others. It is a measure to always remind us that's theirs, it's not ours, so therefore you don't name them. You may be familiar with the practice that Jews in different parts of Europe had, that when the name of a saint was part of the name of the town, they altered the name of the town in their speech. So, for example, the name Satmer, you know, came from what town in Hungary? Saint Mary. Sat- right, which is really St. Mary. So... It means big village? I had always understood that it was about Mary, and that was why they changed it. Oh, okay, that's wrong. Okay, so now we have two explanations. Big village or, uh, or situated by the river, but neither of them involve Mary. Okay, I learned something new. Maybe in Hungarian, I will ask. Okay, please do. You've got homework. But it, it's still true in other places. It's still true in other places, but I'd be curious to learn the true etymology of Satmar now. So uh, I, I look forward to getting that information. The, but either way, that's why I keep saying JC is in fulfillment of that, uh, of that practice. So, yeah. Yes. Correct. So the Talmud says where a name makes it into Tanakh, it's okay to mention it. If it's in scripture, then it's okay to mention it because it's there. You know, God had no problem saying it, but otherwise we don't. So he doesn't make it in because he's too late. I know they think that he's there, but he's not there. The, um, okay. So he gives them this document offering them safe passage, but he says specifically for the sake of the Christian Savior. So in a converse. In a conversation that followed between the Jewish visitors and the Wittenberg professor of Hebrew, Matthias Aurogallus, I'm guessing, one of them is said to have taken offense at this formulation. They didn't like that. So they instead used the term tola, or taula, more likely if they were German. Taula, 
Right? What is litlot in Hebrew? To hang. So one who is hung, as in executed by hanging, is talui. So strung up, as he, uh, as he renders it here. And was indignant that this man's suffering alone, and not those of history's many innocent victims, were regarded as significant. Why do you make such a big deal about his crucifixion when so many people have suffered down through the ages? Luther was very angry about when he heard about this conversation. And it comes up a lot for him, as we'll see later on. Finally, in 1537, um, Luther is approached by a person who is identified here in this text as Joseph ben Gershon Razheim. Uh, in Hebrew, Yosel Ish Razheim. He's a very important figure for the Jewish community of that time. Um, we're going to have to talk about him a little bit later, but right now, just reading this account, his, meaning Luther's, personal correspondence with a particular Jew, the rabbi Joseph ben Gershon Razheim, known as Yosel von Razheim, occurred in the summer of 1537. The latter was widely known as the representative, the Stadlan, Stadlan, one who works on behalf of others, and patron of the Jewish communities of the emperor's court and of those of other rulers. He approached Luther because Elector Johann Friedrich of Saxony, whose subject Luther had been since 1532, had issued a decree in 1536 expelling all Jews from his territories and even refusing them safe passage on their journey. So Yassel approaches Luther, and Luther refuses to help. He says, I help these Jews all the time, and what do I get for it? They don't convert, they don't accept what I say, they call my God the one who was strung up, uh, I'm not interested in helping. He wasn't helping anyway, but that's what he said. There are a few other smaller events, but this gives you a sense of the type of interaction he has, right? What is it that, when, when does Luther meet Jews? When they need his help. He doesn't have any day-to-day interaction. It's always, Luther, could you do this? Luther, could you do that? That's really, you know, that's really when he meets them, and I think that may color his impression. When you see people on a day-to-day basis, then it's different. He does it because the Jews have been expelled. He doesn't see them, you know, walking in the street. He doesn't see them at the store. He doesn't have any first-hand inter- in, you know, involvement. So in his early career, Luther publishes that Jews should be tolerated well, And that's what gives the potentially positive impression early on. And the, uh, the, you'll see it in source number two. But keep in mind, as you read this, and you'll see it in the text, his main goal is in order to get Jews to convert. His feeling is, you get more flies with honey, Right? Or bees in the sukkah. They, um, but you get more flies with honey. That's his argument. Take a look at source number two. Our fools, the popes, bishops, sophists, and monks, and I'll leave you to read everything else there, have hither, hitherto so treated the Jews that anyone who wished to be a good Christian would almost have had to become a Jew. He saw the Catholic Church and its treatment of Jews. He says, you know, you wanted to be a good Christian, you practically had to be a Jew rather than be a Catholic. The Catholics were so awful to the Jews. If I had been a Jew and had seen such dolts and blockheads govern and teach the Christian faith, I would sooner have become a hog than a Christian. They have dealt with the Jews as if they were dogs rather than human beings. They have done little else than deride them and seize their property. When they baptize them, they show them nothing of Christian doctrine or life, but only sub Subject them to popishness and monkery, which are two good words. When the Jews then see that Judaism has such strong support in Christian and that Christianity has become a mere babble without reliance on Scripture, right? That's one of his pet peeves, is that Christianity has moved away from strict reliance on Scripture. How can they possibly compose themselves and become right good Christians? I hope that if one deals in a kindly way with the Jews and instructs them carefully from Holy Scripture, many of them will become genuine Christians and turn again to the faith of their fathers, the prophets, and patriarchs, the the true religion. They will only be frightened further away from it if their Judaism is so utterly rejected that nothing is allowed to remain and they are treated only with arrogance and scorn. If the apostles, who also were Jews, had dealt with us Gentiles, as we Gentiles deal with the Jews, there would never have been a Christian among the Gentiles. 
See, they were friendly in the beginning and it won them converts. That's what we ought to be doing. And he says, I think I can correct what the Catholics got wrong. If the Jews should take offense because we confess our JC to be a man and yet true God, we will deal forcefully with that from Scripture in due time. Don't worry about it. We'll get that out of them. But this is too harsh for a beginning. Let them first be suckled with milk and begin by recognizing this man Jesus as the true Messiah. After that they may drink wine and learn also that he is true God. For they have been led astray so long and so far that one must deal gently with them as people who have been all too strongly indoctrinated to believe that God cannot be man. Therefore, I would request and advise that one deal gently with them and instruct them from Scripture. Then some of them may come along. Instead of this, we are trying only to drive them by force, slandering them, accusing them of having Christian blood if they don't stink. uh, And I know not what other foolishness. In other words, Jews have a bad smell, and that's why they need to drink Christian blood in order to to get rid of their smell, because Reichardt wasn't uh, in business yet. um, So long as... But notice that he calls it foolishness. He calls the allegation foolishness. That's going to change over the course of his career. So long as we thus treat them like dogs, how can we expect to work any good among them? Again, when we forbid them to labor and do business and have any human fellowship with us, thereby forcing them into usury, how is that supposed to do them any good? If we really want to help them, we must be guided in our dealings with them, not by papal law, but by the law of Christian love. We must receive them cordially, permit them to trade and work with us, that they may have occasion and opportunity to associate with us, hear our Christian teaching, witness our Christian life. If some of them should prove stiff-necked, what of it? After all, we ourselves are not all good Christians either. So he argues for emancipation. Betty, you're shaking your head. Now I'm upset. I was perfectly following what we... That's really hard to hear. This, this seems yes. to be the method of the Jews for Jesus. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is exactly what they do. Yeah, I read... The, I saw a headline. I didn't read the article. I saw a headline the other day that apparently there was a, a Jews for J couple that was posing as an Orthodox family. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's where, where were they posing? That's, uh, yeah. but no, but they weren't Jews. They're not they're Jews. Christian. No, they're Jews for yeah. right. They, they I mean, you don't have to be Jewish to be Jews for J. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, Jews for what? Yeah. What they were posing? They were posing as an Orthodox family in they order to, a, to attract people. Yeah, they were never Jewish at all. They. Um, oh yeah, really? From what I've seen, behind what I've seen, the term "coach" is somebody who is interested in Judaism and well disposed to it, whereas the term. Well, I mean, yeah. Um, he does say that he wishes to uh, um, friend you in order to convert them. Ah, okay. So using it that way, then then yes, you can see that. I agree with that. If 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 the definition is going to simply be um, yeah, that that expressing love for Jews as a means of converting them, right. then yes. So like with the modern. Right-wing evangelists in the state who are very, very pro. Right. So what? What the agenda of the evangelicals is is actually a bigger discussion. Yeah. You know, they. Um, it's more complicated in my experience than that. Than than, than that. You know, what the, what their what their what their end game is. No, not necessarily. There's more to be, but I'm not doing that now. We're doing Luther today. Rabbi Kelman here was greatly involved. Interesting. Okay, but um, you can't. That's okay. But you can't kid yourself into thinking that he liked Jews or Judaism because even in the early years he had a very strong animosity for Jews. On, a partic- on, on particular points. Number one, our personal traits, our hunger for money, as he, uh, as he put it. Take a look at source number three, also from Kaufman, based on a sermon of Luther. It was also important in the history of the impact and reception of the little sermon and the great sermon on usury, which you know, he issued sermons and published them. That starting with the first editions printed in Wittenberg, they were published with title pages featuring woodcuts showing a rapacious Jewish usurer with captions such as, pay up or pay interest for I want profit, or my name is Rabbi and I always want gain. The, um, and in, in Kaufman's book, he actually has pic- 
pictures, like you can see the woodcut with the caption and everything. It's clear, stereotypical picture of a Jew. The, um, can Luther be blamed for the anti-Semitic title page? In other words, you'll say, well, maybe the publisher did it. And how do you know that was Luther? He's not the illustrator. Um, in the case of the Sermon on Usury, Luther had thoroughly revised the text, both versions of which the Wittenberg printer Johann Grunenberg published with the same woodcut as the, as the title page. From this, it seems reasonable to conclude that Luther apparently was not offended by this anti-Jewish spin on his criticism of contemporary finance, though it narrowed the scope of his criticism, because he was trying to criticize the Christians for usury, but the picture makes it sound like it's a critique of the Jews, so it actually defeats his message. Or else that he willingly accepted it as an aspect of the printed version that would boost sales. Right? You'll get people to buy your book if it looks like it's something that's anti-Jewish. The, um, he comes back to the Jews and, and money lending later on. He was also upset because he believed that the Jews, even when they do accept Christianity, do it in name, but not in substance. Either we refuse to convert, or we are insincere when we convert. To which I say guilty is charged. Right? People who are converting under duress don't be angry when they do it only in name. Like That's not a shock. The, um, but take a look at source number four from his commentary on Psalm 109. He says, he's talking about refusal to convert. We see this in our daily contacts with Jews, how stiff and stubborn they are from one generation to the next. They are incredibly venomous and spiteful in their language about JC. What we believe and teach about JC they regard as sheer poison and a curse. They suppose that he was nothing more than a criminal who because of his crime was crucified with other criminals. Whenever they mention him, therefore, they refer to him odiously as Thaula the Hanged One, which of course is a reference back to that story that we saw before. And the story clearly made an impact on him because five years later he's still talking about it. The, um, the, but he, he says, these Jews, they, they have such animosity, they refuse to convert, they refuse to accept what we, what, what, we are, uh, what, what we are preaching to them. And when they convert, it's insincere. If you take a look at source number five, in a letter of February 1530 to the superintendent of Magdeburg, his old friend Nicolaus von Amsdorf, Luther expressed very similar views, meaning the view that Jews aren't really converting. He was, he said, not at all happy to hear that Amsdorf intended to baptize, quote, his Jew. They are rogues, in other words, devils. The evidence quoted leaves no doubt that Luther distrusted Jews who were willing to be baptized. He didn't trust us. Imagine that. Sorry? His Jew, meaning the Jew he's been working on. Yeah. Yeah. Could you please um, help me with one concept here? How do we leap from talking about that he did not have day to day relations, you know, work or friendships or whatever with Jewish people, and yet comes to all these massive conclusions? What do you think? And there has to be a leap. No, 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 but I, I'm really missing it. Because oh, okay. First we're starting out right. with him giving them safe passage at the beginning, or yeah. pretending to, whatever. Yeah. And then we, not that many years later, we're here. Right, in the same in the same passage, in the same in the same events. What Luther is is doing is he is blending standard Christian thought about Jews. Oh, okay. Yeah. So other people's. Oh, absolutely. Standard tradition, along with stereotypes, which were prominent, you know, in uh, in those days. This is a period when Jews again are being accused of poisoning wells, you know, kidnapping Christian babies and using their blood for matzah and so forth. The um, the issue of usury, right? Jews being money lenders. All of these are common tropes in Europe of the day, and. Luther has absorbed it. And again, even though he doesn't have Jewish friends, so to speak, he doesn't see them on a day-to-day basis, his limited interactions just cement the hostility. These Jews want things from me. These Jews refuse to listen when I talk to them about salvation and about Christian doctrine and so on. All the reports he's receiving are the Jews, in fact, are not going along with the Christian message, which is true. We weren't. So... That's where the animosity comes from. And the nice treatment of, let me give them safe passage, is simply as he himself said, in order to try to gain favor with them so that they will be more open to conversion. Stephen. 
these first, we're taking a viewpoint uh, from our viewpoint, but we should be considering their viewpoint. These so-called, what we're calling Christians, didn't consider themselves necessarily Christians. Maybe in, at some time in history they did. They considered themselves as the Jews, as the inheritors of of the five books of Moses and the Tanakh, and, uh, and that they were the authentic Jews, that's the whole issue. That they disregard us and they say, we've gone astray and not them. Is that right? Not so, yes and no. The, um, yes, the concept of replacement theology, the, God that, the, the idea that God has dropped us as the chosen people and they are now the chosen people, is absolutely prominent in their thought. Um, but the terminology to say that the word Jews means us now, so to speak, that's not something they're doing. He's very, very clear. When he uses the word Jew, you know who he's talking about. He's talking about us. They, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's for sure. Um, so he's, he believes that we are personally evil. He believes that we are religiously flawed, refusing to convert, pretending to convert. Etty, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to get through this section first. Um, He also, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is very against rabbinic writings and Jewish beliefs on the whole. Take a look, please, at source number six from his commentary to Psalm 1. That psalm talks about... A righteous person who does not walk in the path of the wicked, but who instead desires the Torah of God and spends his days meditating on God's law. Look at what he says about this in source number six. He says, their meditation, the Jews' meditation, is not on the law of the Lord, but rather to the contrary. The law of the Lord is in their meditation, which is a horrible situation. What does he mean by that? What what does that mean? They are the ones who twist the scriptures to their own understanding, and by their own fixed meditation compel the scriptures to enter it and agree with it, when it ought to be the other way around. In this way, the law of the Lord is in their meditation, and to their meditation on the law of the Lord. In other words, what he's trying to say, what what he's trying to, to suggest here is that... We've come up with our ideas, rabbinic ideas, and we force scripture to fit our ideas. So we are not meditating on the law of the Lord, we are changing the law of the Lord to suit our meditations. That's his allegation against the Jews. And again, this is part of his allegation against the Catholic Church also. Too much human stuff. Go back to what he believes Scripture is actually trying to say. He's also very much against, and again I mentioned this last week, the idea that mitzvot and ritual gain the favor of God. Take a look at source number 7 from his lectures on Galatians from their testament. He says, the law, I say, the man of the synagogue or of any people whatever that is situated outside the grace of God does indeed, though to his own grief, beget many children. But they are all sinners because in their reliance on the wisdom of the law and on righteousness by the works of the law, they glory in the law on the grounds that they have become such people as they are on the basis of the law and that in the whole outward appearance of their life they have become similar to their parent that is the law. In other words, these Jews obsess over the law. It's all about what ritual you performed, and did you perform it the right way, and all of that. And he says, elsewhere he writes, they turn God into like a cobbler, somebody who works on shoes, and you know, you give him a job to do, and he does your job for you. So you go to God and you say, I did the commandments, so God, now you have to reward me. That's his view of the idea of reward and punishment and mitzvot and averot, commandments and transgressions. His, his thought is that, that it's a misconception of what God wants, that Christianity comes to teach, that all of that ritual is misguided. You just have to rely on God's grace in order to be saved, believe in God, have faith in God, and love God, and that's, uh, and that's all there is. So he's against us doctrinally. He also was very against Kabbalah. 
Kabbalah had a resurgence of sorts back in those, in those days. And he believed that all this Jewish mysticism in Kabbalah is just another way to distract from Scripture. He had a book, or booklet, pamphlet, called Shem HaMeforash. The uh, Shem HaMeforash is the explicit name of God, the Kabbalistic name uh, of God, and all about the weaknesses of Jews and their beliefs, uh, beliefs in this kind of, uh, of mysticism. This is Martin Luther. No, yeah, Martin Luther wrote a book called Shame on the Farash, yes. Yeah? Is there some political element like uh, John Tariq when he tried to do funding for Jewish day schools as a wedge issue across the election? Is there some sentiment that they try to go to scripture and also uh, get the Jews with honey, was a bridge too far, so we threw the Jews under the bus and wanted to be like the rest of them, and, and he was just trying to do um, proof text after proof text because what you said at the beginning about well, let's get it with, with honey. Right. You know, so to what degree were there local politics of him trying to get support from the people or anti Semitism was a core practice, making that as a wedge issue was not going to be successful. And therefore, he made a misstep at the beginning. He made truly a belief was all foolishness and lies. It made no sense. Yeah. But, the, but that wedge issue didn't work so politically, he had to go the other way. And he's pretty good going the other way. Right, so we're going to get to that a little bit when we talk about what caused his shift in tone. There is definitely a political element to it, but not quite the way that, that you're suggesting, but we'll, we'll, we'll see something along those lines. Etty, you were waiting. I was going to ask, if he believes that it's not good deeds that, that um, make him um, have a so how does he know that the people converted are not... Right. So largely because when it came down to it, push came to shove, the, there were plenty of accounts of Jews who had allegedly converted reverting to their Judaism. So in one example that Luther talks about, um, he says they pushed this Jew too far. They, um, the story was that there was a Jew who had converted to, uh, to Christianity, at least in name. And then at one point, word came that he was observing uh, Judaism in private. And they told him he's going to be burned at the stake either way. The only question is, will he be burned as a Christian or as a Jew? And he said, well, then burn me as a Jew. So that's what they did. They, um, but like, you know, there were stories of Jews who professed Judaism or practiced Judaism afterwards, and that's what the... And that was true. And we're proud of that. <laughs> yeah. But to him, it was, look at these dishonest people. They told us they're converting, and now they're not converting. Can't trust them. Um, there was a hand in the back, yeah. No, behind you, Susan, sorry. Yes. Of, of, of uniting Christians and of getting a little adrenaline going. Um, but I want to go back to Jesus criminals um, with the hanging of um, yeah. Jesus and others, and they say with other criminals. I can't remember, but I know there were an enormous number of people hanged by the Romans. Yep. Also crucified, which is hardly mentioned. Yeah. And I'm wondering. Oh, because there were Jewish texts of the time circulating, um, including one we're going to talk about very briefly uh, towards the end, which talked about him as a criminal and said the Romans killed him because he was a criminal, not because of anything to do with us. That, that allegation was made. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to get there. The, um, Susan, and then we're going to go on. But if you're saying, oh, if you're saying that he doesn't good deeds or um, try to repent gets you God's favor, what's the point in repenting after you've done like how does he handle that point of forgiveness? Right. So to them it is the great mystery. How forgiveness works is simply a mis- it, That's what it's called. It's called a mystery. The uh, it's up to God, and God knows what He's doing, and or she, and uh, and that's it. So there's nothing you, you can do to sort of re- if you've done something wrong, to come no. express loving God, try to get close to God, have faith in God, and that's what you do. Yeah. 
The, um, I have to admit, I, I'm not accredited to teach Christian theology, so you know that, that's about, but that's about what I got. The, um, so Luther's late career sees a very open shift to greater hostility. We saw that already regarding Rabbi Yassel's, uh request, but whoa, is it worse than that? Take a look at source number eight, please, from Martin Luther, the Bible, and the Jewish people. The, um, which is a great source book. It's just translations of Luther's writings on the Jews. And very, uh, very handy. They have been bloodthirsty bloodhounds and murderers of all Christendom for more than 1,400 years in their intentions and would undoubtedly prefer to be such with their deeds. Sorry for the color of the text there. Thus they have been accused of poisoning water and wells, of kidnapping children, of piercing them through with an awl, of hacking them in pieces, and in that way secretly cooling their wrath with the blood of Christians, for all of which they have been condemned to death by fire. He's not only describing what has been done to Jews, he is describing what he believes should be done to Jews because we have been bloodthirsty bloodhounds and so forth. You see the year, this is 1543. Take a look at the, uh, the next source, number 9. Kaufman reproduces some of the recommendations Luther made in his book, this was the big one, The Jews and Their Lies. His final solution to the Jewish question, and yes, it's his phrase, that's Luther's phrase, contained the following detailed recommendations. If it rings a bell, there's a reason for that. Synagogues should be burnt or completely razed for the honor of J.C. and Christendom and as a token of, quote, our serious intent. Further measures compiled from both lists were destruction of Jews' homes. Instead, they should be put under a roof or in a barn with the aim of letting them know that they are not the masters in our land. Then the Jews should have all their books, prayer books, the Talmudic texts, the whole Bible, taken from them with not a page left behind. Jewish religious worship was to be banned on pain of loss of life and limb. Any provisions for safe conduct were to be absolutely suspended, for Jews were no longer to be allowed to function as, quote, bosses, officials, or tradesmen. The consideration that a section of the population that had been marginalized and humiliated in this way might prove a security risk by seeking revenge and thus represent a threat to the powers that be led Luther to suggest that Germany should behave in accordance with the general prudence of other nation, nations such as France, Spain, Bohemia, etc. and remove from the Jews what they have taken from us by usury while always expelling them from the country. Yeah. This was our friend. This was the uh, this, this is his shift. The, um, and he produces more, even after the Jews and their lies, he has more to say about Jews. I mean, this was like a serious focus. You'd think he had nothing else to do with this time. The, um, he, the, uh, sorry. He, uh, no. <laughs> Definitely not. But, but he's thinking about us an awful lot. Um, so what caused the shift in tone? So part of it is the sins of the Jews. The fact that we are refusing to convert. If you take a look at source number 10 from Elisheva Karlbach, Jewish Responses to Christianity and Reformation Germany. Another example of failed implementation of Jewish-Christian disputation on German soil, meaning, let me unpack that. You know about the Spanish disputations, the ones that the Catholic Church ran earlier. So apparently the German uh, Protestants try it also. But they don't succeed. So an example of that is that of Antonius Margarita, who was a Jew who converted to Christianity. His father was a rabbi. Ya- uh, Yaakov Margoliot, I believe. So when this convert from Judaism published his book in 1530, exposing, so to speak, the treasure, the treachery of Jews and the subversive rituals of Judaism, Charles V, the first Habsburg emperor to govern both Spanish and German territories, ordered that a disputation be staged. He ordered Yossel of Rosheim, ombudsman of imperial Jewry, to defend the Jewish position against Margarita's new charges, 1530. It was not configured along the lines of a public religious disputation. No other Jews were compelled to appear. Usually Jews had to be an audience in order to be, con- you know, to be convinced of the truth of Christianity. No theologians cited proof texts or logic to buttress their religious claims. No protocols were preserved. No one took minutes. Usually there were minutes. Or apparently even written by any of the participants. According to Yassel, the results of this confrontation were bitter for Margarita. Now keep in mind, the Jew is the one writing the record. The aforementioned baptized Jew was arrested and expelled from the city, an inconceivable outcome for a true religious polemic. 
The event at Augsburg was no medieval-style disputation over the correctness of the Jewish faith or the superiority of Christianity, but rather a political debate as to whether the emperor should extend the customary privileges of toleration to Jews as his imperial forebears had done. The desired result was not the conversion of Jews, but the clarification of the new emperor's Jewry policy. Medieval-style disputations do not seem to have been widely emulated nor even correctly understood by German clergymen. They didn't really know what they were doing when they set this up. And the result of it is they don't succeed in converting us, which angers Luther. He also... Yeah. Uh, how does Luther uh, end up... Uh, getting the idea of St. Paul and all of the Jews that were uh, Christian yeah. converts, uh, how does he... He's, he loves that. No, he says that those were the good ones and that we failed to follow their lead. But does he not think that the Jews then, in general, are the... Uh, oh, he absolutely does. And in his early writings, he says that's proof that it can work. Yeah. But in his later writings, it's like, no, they, these Jews, well, no, he actually writes that our blood has become diluted. And we're no longer really descendants of those people. We're no longer like them. That's his, uh, that's his phrase. But St. Paul, yeah. he said that uh, this is much too difficult to keep in Kashu, for yeah. example. Much too difficult for the uh, general population. So we'll just cut that out. Yeah, no, but he believes that the, uh, that the, the Jews of his day are not worthy descendants of those. I'm going to go further because there's a lot more we need to, we need to talk through here. Um, he despises us religiously. The, um, I brought you in source number 11 where he talks about specific rituals of the Jews and ridicules them. Um, the uh, various ceremonies, superstitions, and so forth. And you can take a look at number 11 later. I'm not going to go through it now. But he comes to believe in the bizarre charges against the Jews. Like we said, that they were drinking Christian blood. Right? He, he promotes that idea. So part of it is his belief in the sins of the Jews makes him change. Other factors, though, take us back to the political point that was raised before. Not a political point in terms of currying favor with Germans, but currying favor with Catholics. Meaning, take a look at source number 12 from Kaufman. In the writings of Orthodox Catholic theologians of the 1520s and 1530s, Luther is repeatedly held responsible for the Jews getting ideas. In other words, becoming recalcitrant. His call for tolerance, they claimed, had not led to any significant number of conversions, but to the Jews feeling confirmed in their own religion. In addition, it was usual in Catholic polemics for Luther, as leader of the heretics, to be blamed for all the developments inside the Reformation. So they look at him and say, you, you're good to the Jews, and that's why all this is happening. So now he has to go prove right, that he's not good to the Jews. The, um, the Jews, as usual, fall in the middle in that, in that regard. So that's a, uh, that is a factor in, in what goes on. And by the way, there were Jews who looked at Luther as the one who's going to undermine the church. I gave you an example of this in number 13 from a later period, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Rimenov, so you're talking about already the time of the Hasidim, in late 18th century Poland, talks about how false ideologies ultimately disappear. And he gives you some examples, and if you flip the page to the end of that quote, he said the same thing is true regarding this lowly faith, by which he means Christianity, which will disappear steadily in our days has already experienced great damage via one Luther. That's what he writes. He writes it in Hebrew, Luther Echad. The, uh, some guy named Luther. But truth stands eternally. So the Jews see him as somebody who's going to undermine Catholicism. There was also a political fear of Jews, but not really from Luther. Others had a fear of Jews. And I brought you an example from Elisheva Kravach's paper in source number 14, of others fearing that Jews were going to support the Ottomans against the Christians and so be a, uh, a, an undermining element within society. You don't see it in Luther's writings, as far as I've seen, but that's there. However, Kaufman throws out a very interesting idea that, the, uh, that I think has a lot of merit to it. Kaufman
Kaufman suggests the whole policy of tolerance was not Luther's idea in the first place. That whole thing wasn't Luther's idea. There's a fellow by the name of Justice Jonas, who was a university colleague of Luther in the early days. He was a friend. He was also the Latin translator of Luther. He translated Luther from German into Latin for, for publication. And he believed that the Jews had been led astray from God, just as the Catholics had. The Catholics originally were Christian and then went astray. So to the Jews have been led astray. And so that the goal is, uh, the goal should be that, that they should be brought to come back to Christianity. And when Luther publishes that J.C. was born a Jew, it's not in order to convert Jews, but to convince Christians of Jonas' idea. His audience is not the Jews. His audience is the Christians. And you can see it in the excerpt I gave you before. His audience really is the church. And when Luther gives up on converting the Jews, and he says, you know what, Jonas was wrong, it's never going to work, then he publishes the Jews and their lies as a means of recanting from what was never his approach in the first place. He never thought this was going to, to work. I brought you an excerpt from, uh, from Kaufman in source number 15. And uh, he, you know, he talks about this, this issue. I'm jumping to the end of it. He, the last paragraph, number 15. To interpret the motivations rooted in early Reformation thinking that gave rise to that J.C. was born a Jew as an example of tolerance is completely alien to the 16th century. It's an invention of the modern era. When we look at the logic underlying the ordering of Luther's works in the different editions of his work, we cannot escape the impression that even this text was read as a rule, as an, as, as an exegetical tract directed against the Jews. It was really about how you interpret scripture and how you understand philosophically what the position of the Jews is, that's really what it was about. Now, I have two more big things to discuss, so I'm going to hold questions at this point until, until afterwards to make sure we get through two major elements. Number one, the impact of Luther's writings. The impact of his harshness against the Jews. So the early impact actually isn't all that strong. On the Jews and their lies, his major anti-Jewish tract was the least successful of his writings about Jews. It's very interesting. Jonas translated it into Latin, the, um, even though it was a departure from his approach. But it was his least successful, in terms of like bestsellers, it didn't sell all that well. I think he, had, he, had, he only had two printings in the German, whereas others went to like seven, um, and only one in the Latin. It was pushed among the Protestant princes. Um, Albrecht of Prussia said he was going to use it to guide his policy, but the public wasn't that into it. Some suggest because they already believed these things anyway, so it wasn't like it got any headlines. Um, but more likely because they were involved in commerce with the Jews, they needed the Jews. To buy into this wouldn't have succeeded. One area where he was successful, though, and I brought you an excerpt on it in number 16 from Stephen Burnett, was in getting censorship of Jewish publications in German lands. That you did find as a result of Luther's efforts. The ensuing century sees competing trends. There are fans of Luther's anti-Jewish writing who allege that Jews have been repressing Luther's writing. You want to know why on Jews and their lies didn't spread? It's the Jews who have prevented it. And the truth is, they're not wrong. Yassel of Rosheim succeeded in getting it banned in Strasbourg. They, uh, he, he actually did that. At the same time, there were Protestant preachers who promoted Luther's approach in the following century, and it remains active in the German world until, yes, the 20th century. And there is no doubt that Nazi thinking is heavily, heavily influenced by Luther's writing. That doesn't mean that every Lutheran was a follower of Luther in this regard. It's really, really important to say that. Um, I've known Lutheran priests, you know, in our day, who certainly were not uh, followers of his, uh, of his preaching regarding Jews, and I believe them. Um, I'm really going to hold questions. Just um, I want to make sure to get to one last major point, which is, how did Jews respond? So, the, um, his early tolerance... 
his early tolerance that he promoted, had some people convinced that he was on our side. And they came to him for help, like we talked about. He also increased an existing trend of messianism. Messianism is strong in the Jewish world already at the end of the 15th century. Susan, this goes back to our discussion in yesterday's class. The, um, when the Jews are expelled from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and Portugal, parts of Italy, when the Jews go through these expulsions, they think this is the trouble that we're expecting before the time of the Messiah. The wars between the Christians and the Muslims are the wars to end all wars that are going to lead to a messianic period. The, um, that's something that's been building from the time of the Crusades. But in particular, Don Isaac of Barbanel, leader of the Jews in many ways in the you know, Christian Spain and Portugal, uh, predicted that the Messiah was going to come in the year 1502. It didn't happen. He said 1503. didn't happen. 1504. He was basing himself on verses in the book of Daniel, which could be read in that way. It, it wasn't crazy to, uh, to read it that way. Um, he also argued that things like the exploration of the new world were signs that Mashiach, the Messiah, was coming. The time was ripe for this sort of thing. Traditional institutions in the Jewish community were weakened as we were tossed around from place to place. And so you found a false Messiah named Asher Lamaline, who comes around at the beginning of the 16th century. Solomon Molcho is active during the time of Luther in the 1530s. The, um, the Catholic Church is being weakened by Luther's Reformation. That in and of itself plays into the idea of a Mashiach coming, that the Messiah is near. Look, the church is in collapse. So, the, um, so Luther actually triggers more belief that the Messiah is going to come. But the overall reaction was fear. Obviously, fear of punishment by the church or by the Protestants, whichever one, choose your enemy, um, for our materials which contained anti-Christian elements. I brought you, in source number 18, number 17 is about the explorers and Abarbanel, but in number 18, I brought you how Yassel of Rosheim is called upon to defend Jewish writings, they, uh, lest they be censored. So he talks here about how Luther had made claims about the Jews and about how the Jews slander their savior and all that. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. And he describes a particular book. He mentions that Shem HaMafarash publication. But he also talks about a particular book. Anyone here ever hear of Toldo Yeshu? Toldo Yeshu is an ancient text that is meant to describe Jesus and the founding ideas of Christianity, the founding legends of Christianity, in the most derogatory way possible. And it was always passed down in a way that would keep it in hiding. But they always knew it was there, they just couldn't find it. And so Yassel of Rosheim is called upon to testify about this. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Once in Strasbourg, someone complained to me that he got a book and it contained some terrible writings about the Messiah, but I don't even want to mention it. But as she goes on, we're at number 18, she notes that Yassel is not telling the whole story because he wrote a book called Sefer HaMikna, and in that, ma- in that manuscript, he also copied several sections of Toldo Yeshu for preservation. So he had access to the book that he absolutely denied existed. The, um, but there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear also that in responding to his ideas, in responding to Luther's religious ideas, that will cause a backlash against us. There's a lot of fear of responding, and so the result of that, and Ronit Weinstein talks about that in source number 18. Her paper is available online. Generally, when you see something in here that's not in black ink, like it's a little bit lighter, it means that I found a place where I cut and paste it instead of having to retype it. But, the, um, but their black ink was not quite the color of mine. In any case, the... Um, the Ronit Weinstein writes about um, how the Jews in their literature don't respond really to Luther's ideas and she suggests it's because we turned away from focusing on theology it was much more about just preserving our communities and their practices but also that we were afraid 
to engage in a dialogue in which we would be seen to be harsh to the ideas of the Reformation. Plus, in number 20 from Elisha of Karlbach, there is fear of retribution. There's fear of political instability during this period of time. So in terms of, of how Jews respond, there's this early hope for his, from his tolerance. There is a growth in Messianism. But overall, it's immense fear. Because we're vulnerable. Vulnerable politically, vulnerable religiously. And the result of this fear is, number one, a great emphasis on preserving customs within communities. is a growth of literature that tries to preserve our practices, but also major shift. German Jewish scholarship shifts east. It shifts to Poland. It shifts to Prague. The morale of Prague rises in this period of time. The Maharal of Prague is the Golem figure, although he never made one, but that's a story in and of itself. The, um, but because the Jews are so afraid of what's coming down the pike as a result of the Reformation, the community just shrinks. There's very little that survives in terms of rabbinic writing from 16th century Germany that is sort of dominant. I mean, there were rabbis there, and work has been done on who those rabbis were and what they wrote, but when you look at the dominant religious figures in Judaism from the 16th century, they're not in Germany. They're off to the east. That trend began when the Jews were expelled from Spain, from Portugal, and so on, either went to the Turks, went to the Ottoman Empire, or went east where they were accepted. And that's going to be in the Philo-Semites talk when we talk about Casimir, which is, uh, who sets the stage for it. But, the, um, but that trend of Jews moving east accelerates at this point. I brought you in source number 21 from Jay Berkowitz. He talks about this. He says, signs of cultural decline were already evident in the migration patterns of rabbinic scholars in the 14th century. It's already happening. Many went east to Bohemia, Moravia, Austria, and eventually to Poland. Others journeyed south to Italy, which, again, didn't work out that well in the 15th century. By the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, the Jews had been expelled from nearly all the large cities in Germany, with the notable exceptions of Frankfurt on Main and Worms, whose residence was, where residence was restricted to the Jewish quarter, and so on. The waning of Torah study in Germany lamented the passing of the glory 